Am I a fan or a follower? Am I a fan or a follower? Ushers, you are dismissed. When I seek God in my, my studies, I labor in prayer with the master. There is no, no uh, website that, that ministers of the gospel can go to and just bring down a weekly message. God speaks to every man of God individually, especially pastors, the angels of the house, because he sees the condition of the flock. And he speaks to the man of God and enlightens his spirit only through prayer as to what the needs of his people are. So I was reading scripture and, and going through, thank goodness for the internet these days, you can find all kinds of information there. And I saw and came across an article in the Discipleship Journal. It was from February in January of 1982. It was an article that was written by a young woman by the name of Lauren Sani. Lauren Sani. And the article caught my attention because it, it started out with one of the ministers of this great nation. They would, they would call him America's preacher, America's pastor. Billy Graham, well known throughout the globe as a mighty man of God. Billy Graham brought millions to salvation. Pastors today pale in comparison to the word and the gospel that he preached to places that men were fearing to go into. But Dr. Graham had no fear. He was on an assignment, just as you and I are on assignment. And you'll find in this text this morning, we are each on assignment. But I ask and I pray that you would find yourself in this message and where you fit in this word, because it spoke to me. And it went on to say, uh, years ago, not speaking of myself, but as an individual who was in the article, and we'll call him, we'll call him Tom. Tom says, he writes in the article, that I was at a Billy Graham crusade. And I came forward that evening and gave my heart to Christ. And Tom goes on to say, after he gave his heart to Christ, the next Sunday, he visited the church that he often went to occasionally. Uh, and he was speaking at the end of service to one of the elders. Let's call this elder Jeremiah. He was speaking with elder Jeremiah. And Tom went to Jeremiah and says, elder Jeremiah, I was at the crusade last week in the ballpark and I gave my soul to Christ. And elder Jeremiah says, how wonderful. What a great decision you've made. Now, Brother Tom says to Jeremiah, how long have you and I been business associates? And here's where the elder says, well, we've been in business together now for over 23 years. And Tom says to Jeremiah, have you been a Christian this entire time, those 23 years? And elder Jeremiah says, yes, I have. And here's what caught my eye. Brother Tom says to Brother Jeremiah, I've always thought you to be a fine man, a man worth looking up to, of great value, of, of high standards. And over the 23 years that we've known each other, I saw you as someone I wanted to emulate. But you've never mentioned Christ to me. So I was of the impression that I don't have to be a Christian 
to be a good person. This is what caught my ear and caught my eye. Having been a Christian for 23 years, this elder says that he has never spoken to this individual about salvation. And after reading the article, I reflected on the depth of the conversation. A conversation that was going on between two friends for over 23 years, and I thought about it, it was a conversation that could be had even today. 40 years later, it was a conversation that is relevant. It gave me pause. Time to look at myself. And those words first spoke to me. What am I doing to build up the kingdom of God? And is there more that I can still do? And as the leader of this great church, I ask myself, am I a reflection of the gospel that I profess to be the inerrant, infallible word of God? Does my walk line up with my talk? Is there still salvation in this church that I can bring? Or is there just about coming from Sunday to Sunday and putting a dollar in the offering? And returning home after service feeling that I've done all that I need to do until next week. When I repeat that process over and over again, like some mindless hamster running on a wheel in a cage. The wheel goes round and around. He ends up going nowhere, but he runs until he drops dead and has nothing to show for his life, no one to mourn his passing. Having lived a life experience that has been totally empty, nothing in his cage, nothing in his heart, nothing in his, his spirit, having made absolutely no difference in the life of at least one individual. So the question came to mind, am I a fan or a follower? That brings us back to this morning's message, beloved. What is our personal reason for coming to church? Are we like the man or the woman who paints his face and puts on outlandish outfits so that the neighbors see them going to the stadium to cheer on their favorite team? Am I a fan or am I a follower? Today's a good day to get honest with God. Ask yourself this morning, while we are yet seated in the presence of an all-wise, all-knowing, monotheistic father of the universe who has seen all and who knows all is the creator and the author of all things. It's a good time to ask, am I a fan or a follower? Do I make my way to the house of the Lord week after week just so that I can check the boxes? Or do I come seeking? Seeking what? Do I come seeking a closer walk with the Father? Do I come seeking an answer to the diagnosis? Do I come seeking uh, uh, knowledge on how I can mend this relationship? Realizing that wherever two or more are gathered in his name, there too shall he be in the midst. Maybe it's a marriage that needs mending. Or like the woman with the issue of blood. Are you here seeking this morning, understanding this morning, realizing in the power of the God that we serve? Are you here understanding that like she did after 12 years suffering with the issue of blood, that if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I would be made whole. Where is your faith? Where is your focus? What is it that you come to see this morning? The show? There is none here. What's, what's going on in your mind this morning? Are you, are you out there in the world? 
Or are you here? Are you, are you present? Is your mind where your feet are? You'd be surprised how distracted people get right in the congregation. That's what I mean. Check the boxes. I was there. I had the, I had the clothes on. I had the appearance of a follower, but I was just a fan. The neighbors saw me go. But when they were down and out, when they needed prayer, no one called me. No one knows that you're a follower of Jesus. There is no evidence in your life. You're the hamster running around in the cage, going nowhere, having nothing, indulging in the things of the world. Or maybe you're coming here this morning because you're just tired of playing church. This is your day. Are you tired of playing church and have you come to the realization that all your associations are fake? That's a good place to stick a praise. How many people in your life have you got on your list of friends that you can go to and you can seek prayer and you can seek counsel and you can be strengthened by the word of God? Or are they just fake, casual relationships? Hi and goodbye. Are you here this morning because you're ready for the real thing? Ready to commit and to ask yourself, am I a fan or a follower? Like many of us who have had to ask ourselves, self-included, is this all that there is? I've been there. Had all the shiny things, big cars, houses, money in the bank, all that kind of stuff. Infamy, little, little celebrity, people knew who I was. And one day I had to ask myself. I looked around and saw all the things that I had amassed on this journey when I wasn't seeking God. Then I came to the realization that I've been blessed by Satan. He gave me those things that I would continue down the path that I was traveling. Totally distant from the God of the universe. The Alpha and the Omega. Satan said, here, here, here's a car. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I'm thinking it's the Lord, but it's the shiny thing. Satan said, here, here's, a, here's another check coming in the mail. There was a time in, when, when I had checks coming in the mail. And, and Satan just handed me another check. Anything to keep me distracted. And so when I asked, is it just the things of the world, the shiny thing that Satan has placed in front of me, only that I would be distracted and realize that he is still out to seek, steal, and destroy my soul. Satan has not changed, my beloved. Neither has God changed. The same God that sits on the throne room of heaven this morning, heaven, is an author and the finisher of my life. But the same angel that was cast out of heaven is on assignment for himself. He is doing whatever is within his power to keep us from getting there. I know what some people are going through. That's why I say this, the word speaks to me first. I know what's happening in some of the homes in this congregation. I know how, de how desperately Satan desires you. Satan, Satan desires your marriage. Satan desires your children. Satan desires you to walk his way. So he will lure you and you'll walk around thinking that there is no God. If there was a God, but that is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. If you can see it, that ain't faith. Faith is the substance of things not seen. And when you can walk in that belief, then you are walking hand in hand with the Savior. Satan wants you to believe that, that this is all there is. You only go around once, so grab all the gusto 
that you can. Who cares what people say? They just jealous of you anyway. My beloved, let me tell you what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, that so you shall reap. So if you sow into uh, bad soil, you will get a bad harvest. But if you sow into fertile ground, you will yield much fruit. So what is the gusto that you desire? What is it that you're seeking? What has Satan told you? This is it. Pay them no mind. I've got something for you that's greater than what this invisible God, what this non-seeing God, what this heaven that, you, that no one has ever come back and told you about. It's in the book. The angel told Lazarus, why should I let you go back? Why should I send someone to your brothers if they don't believe the prophets or the preacher? What makes you think coming back from the grave is going to make a difference? This is where we are today. I look around at the times that we're living in. Everything is being canceled, but sin. How can that be? Everything, including Dr. Seuss, has been canceled and done away with, not to be used or looked at again, but sin running rampant. People don't want to hear about the Holy Ghost. Maybe it's just me. But I ask, are you a fan or a follower? Stop tolerating the unacceptable. Where is the evidence of the God that you came to meet this morning? Where is the proof that Jesus lives? How did you make it here? You didn't didn't wake up this morning on your own? Do you really think that the alarm clock woke you this morning? It was the finger of God. It was the touch from the Holy Spirit. I've told you time and time again, the last words out of my mouth before I I go to sleep is thank you, Lord. Everybody don't lay down at night. How dare you lay down on Jesus without a prayer or a word of thanks? Have you no gratitude? Where is your faith? You think you made it all day based on your own circumstances? Some good People will pass away today. It's not because they deserve to die. It's because no man knows the day or the hour, Sister Sharon. So when I go to bed at night, it's thank you, Lord. And when I wake up in the morning, it's thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I was in the grocery store just yesterday, and I was talking to a young lady. She had a beautiful spirit, a wonderful spirit. Had the right job. I mean, if you got a job and a person to represent the company that you work for, she was the one. Just as pleasant as she could be. And then I asked her the question, the only question that came to my mind, I'm a preacher. I said, what's your pastor's name? She don't have a pastor. I said, little girl, you you need a church. That's the question you need to ask. That should be the first question out of your mouth when you run into somebody nice. Oh, you run into somebody who's not so nice. Say, what's your pastor's name? If they can't answer that question, all the rest of the box is going to be blank. All the rest of them are going to be blank. It begins with that and it ends with that. If you don't know your pastor's name, then you obviously don't know the church that he pastors. You don't know who the leadership is and you have not heard the word. That's, that's, that's the way I see things. That's, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's the way it should go for each and every one of us. But I, I would certainly tell, especially the singles in this congregation, you meet a young woman, you meet a young man, first question out of your mouth is, what's your pastor's name? See, that's a, that's a trick question, but I, you, you, put, you put a bow on it. You put a bow on it, they don't see it coming. You understand what I'm saying? They don't see that coming. And, and, and that young man and that young woman, that individual that, that you think is in love with you, ask them what, what their pastor's name is. They can't answer that question. Well, you know, just, just say your farewells. I'll, I'll tell you what Jesus said. Here, here's, what, here's what the master said. He said, shake the dust from your feet. 
That's wise counsel, my beloved. As I live and breathe this morning, Jesus is knocking at the door. He's waiting for your response. And only you can answer the question. Am I a fan or a follower? Are you a spectator? Have you come for the experience of having been in the presence of El Shaddai, God Almighty? Is the word speaking to you today in your spirit? Have you made up in your mind that from this day forward, I'm going to follow Jesus? I remember that day. I remember the day when the Spirit spoke and I answered the knock at my heart's door. And I said, after that moment, I came forward and I gave my heart to Christ. And I said, I will follow Jesus. Let me, tell, let me drop this off for free. God will get your attention. You can put it off as long as you please. You can put it off as, 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 as often as you want to shake it out of your mind but I pray that you don't wait for God to nudge you. Do it yourself. Come willingly. Come before the throne room of heaven and stand before the God of the universe and say, I yield, I yield. I can't hold out no longer. I'm tired of playing church. I'm tired of these fake relationships, these false associations. I'm tired of being a fan. I want to be a follower of Christ. I want to stand on the gospel of Jesus. I want to walk in his way. I want to talk like Jesus. I want to sing like Jesus. I want to worship like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. There's a reason for what he did. He didn't do it as a spectator sport. He didn't do it because he had to do it. He did it because he loved me. And he loved you, Sister Adrian. He did it because he knew down through the years one of us was coming. And there was going to be a, a day in, in your life. That's why I say don't, don't wait for God to nudge you. Don't be like Pastor Billy and wait for the death of a loved one. For the pain to touch that close to home, so close to home that you can't even, you can't, every time you open your mouth, just groans come out. Oh, oh God, if you have never called out to Jesus and had the Holy Ghost interpret your prayer, you have not cried out with the willingness to surrender before the God of the universe. All these fake prayers, these pretty prayers, clapping on. That ain't the way it works. You got to feel the gospel. You got to feel the presence of Jesus. You got to know that he is the El Shaddai. He's monotheistic. There is no other God. How dare you stand before the God of heaven and earth and not fall on your knees? Who do you think you are? Have you so much pride? that you can't even humble yourself before God. And there are people like that. I know some. I know some. They have zero humility. They have zero faith. They have zero a belief that God is greater than they are. And, 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 and I, I know I'm not the only one. You don't have to shake, raise your hand. Because they are there. And those are the ones that Satan would want you to, to emulate. Because you see, see, oh, a, a preacher doesn't look like he's living a, a, you know, a very successful life. Let me tell you something. I've been where many of you are today. I've had what many of you have today. I've had the things of the world. But I wouldn't take nothing for my journey. What God has done for me, where he has brought me from, miles and miles of of dangers and toils and snares, oh, wretched man that I am. God reached down and brought me and said, I, I forgive you, son. I'll walk with you. But first, you're going to have to give up the things of the world. 
and I did. That's because I, I don't want God to bring you there because when, when I was ready to give up the things of the world, didn't nothing else matter to me. I had been brought to that place. I had been brought to that submission. I had brought to the place of God where I knew I had just been a fan of Jesus. I could, I could, I could quote a couple of verses. Huh. I had a couple of uh, prayers in the, in the can. But I had never prayed from my spirit. This is a different kind of prayer that comes up when you cry out to Jesus. Say, oh God, help me. I don't know how I'm going to make it through. But child is sick and he's in the ER. The doctor say it don't look good. When you ain't praying like that, then you ain't praying in the spirit. Praying in the flesh. And so we have to seek him in that way. And when you find yourself crying out because you have that type of relationship with the God of the heaven and earth, you know that you are a follower of Jesus. You've made up in your mind. Okie doke ain't going to get it no more. I'm going to serve him till I die. All I want is Jesus. All I see is Jesus. Every step I take, it's for Jesus. It's by the grace of God. It's not of my own will. Look, at, look how good he's been to us. Look where he brought us from. Some of us have had to come a, a mighty long way, much like your pastor. But here we are this morning in this gospel from Matthew. And these four gospels present a fourfold view of the life of Christ, the knowledge of Jesus Christ can be found in these four depictions. The order of the Gospels has been generally recognized throughout the church history that the Gospel of Matthew will occupy first place. The reason being because of his profound ability to exegete the text. Matthew talks about the preparation of the Messiah. And then he talks about the history of the Messiah, which made him the perfect bridge between the Old and the New Testament. He, he, was, he was serious about his studies. He was serious about the words that God had given him to write down. Remember, this is, this is the inspired word of God. All scripture is given by divine inspiration. So I tell the church on Tuesday night, if you've not been with us Tuesday night, look, if God is not real, then who spoke this? Whose words are these? Where did it all come from? Why are you here? Matthew wrote the gospel as God had inspired him. And I get that. Because as a preacher, as you prepare your message for the people of God, you don't know where it's coming from. And then all of a sudden you find yourself writing down things that you hadn't thought about. But you know it was Jesus. I type for hours. I don't even go back to make the mistakes. Thank God my computer will, will correct it when I go back. But I can't stop now. I got to keep going because God is moving on the inside. Don't quench the spirit. I tell the Lord, have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Where is it coming from? What would you have me to write, Lord? And then I don't even realize until I go back and look at it, brother God. Where did it come from? What was it all about? Even this message this morning. I write and I write and I write all these things down, and then when I get to the point where I come to the pulpit to preach to the people, it's not even what I wrote. God said, preacher, you get it first. I want you to study, to show yourself approved, but then you get out the way. And I will send the helper to break the gospel. So I understand where Matthew is coming from. In these portraits of Jesus, he does so in a very characteristic manner. We all know that Matthew is the tax collector. 
So he spoke to the minds of the Hebrews. Mark writes for the Roman population. And Luke, the physician, the physician missionary who walked with Paul, he speaks to the Greek mentality. So you see, there's something there for everyone. You can't say you don't understand it because God gave it to every man that this gospel will be preached without fear or favor. And then we go into John, and just to drop it off, John spoke to his deity. He, has, he leaves no room for, for guessing. But in Matthew 28, he says, then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. The 11 disciples, we know what happened to the 12. But it does not mean that it was only 11. That's why I say John was profound in his, in his desire to correctly articulate and exegete the text. So I, I, when, I, when I read it, I just don't gleam over it and keep moving. The 11 disciples stick a pen in that. Why is that, why is that relevant, preacher? We'll see. He had already predestined the place for them to meet on a mountain in Galilee. And as you read further, you come back and you see that scripture interprets scripture. So it tells me when I move forward that Jesus expected a crowd. Because in verse 17, he says, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Amen. Selah. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pause right there. Some doubted. That lets me know that something was up. See, people read scripture and they don't take the time to realize that every word in the Bible is, is, is the inspired. So who would have doubted out of the 11? We know that Judas Iscariot, his doubt cost him his life. So you mean that the other 11 doubted? Keep reading, keep reading, because this phrase is one of the countless testimonies in scripture that speak to the integrity of the gospel. Matthew wasn't attempting to exclude or to cover up the truth of what he experienced. When he says the 11 were there, but some doubted, Matthew was there. This is Matthew's account of what he saw. So when he writes that, he's not trying to cover it up or he's not trying to leave out any facts, wherein he could. It speaks to the fact that only one who was concerned with giving the facts and that would incorporate even the smallest detail without the fear of being exposed as a fraud. You remember the Pharisees and the Sadducees hated Jesus. They're the one that, that had him crucified. So when I read that and I go back and I read it again, and then I go back and I read it again, and then I go back and I read it again, why is he saying that? Because he knew that there were some that would, would not believe. The ones that doubted, what, who were they? Who were they? Because if he had said that and there were none that doubted, he would have been exposed. They were, because we'll see it as it is in 1 Corinthians 15 and 6. You can write that down for you note takers. 1 Corinthians 15 and 6, it reads as such. And after that, he was seen above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some had fallen asleep. Paul is talking about what happened that day. That's why you see that some doubted is still in the Bible because it was true. There were upwards of 500 people who were present this day. And there were those that doubted. But it comes into clarity in the next text in verse number 18 that helps us to understand the clarity of it all. And Jesus came, stay there, and spake unto them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And Jesus came. And Jesus came, some doubted, some doubted, and Jesus came. What did that say? I, I, when, and I thought about Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 20 and 15, yes, Luke chapter 20 and 15, where he says, and he rose and went to his father's house, and when he was a ways off, his father saw him and ran and threw himself around his neck and kissed him. And when he was a ways off, his father saw him. See, this is just now, 
Now I'm, I'm working the scriptures now because I need to gain understanding if I'm going to talk about this to people that, don't, that may not have, have picked up their Bible since last Sunday. This is what he's saying here. You have to, to search the scriptures to find the evidence of what he's talking about. Those that doubted were those that didn't recognize him afar off. When my grandson was in, in kindergarten, he, he, he grew up, many of you know that he grew up with me. And I would pick him up from school, first grade. It was first grade because he'd pick him up in the afternoon. And in the school where he attended, they would call for the students to be released and they would walk down a corridor that made sort of an L. And as they walked down the corridor, you couldn't see them coming down until they came to the section where the parents stood to receive the children. So when they called for my grandson to come, that his ride was here, I heard his feet, Sister Carter. And I, I told the young lady, I said, here he comes. She said, no, she says to me, you want me to call him again? I said, no, here he comes. I said, I hear him coming. I hear him coming. See, I, I, I know my child. And when he turned the corner, she said, how did you know that? Said, That's my boy. That's my child. You understand what I'm saying? Those of you that have children, you might be able to identify with this, but those of you who have sisters and brothers and siblings and friends, when you see them afar off, you say, that walk like, that walk like my father. I see, that must be my daddy coming. See, so when she saw my grandson, it amazed her. She marveled at the fact that I knew it was him when he wasn't even there. But it was something about his walk, Brother Mosley. I, I heard that walk and I knew it was my boy. Now, granted, that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. That, that same boy that I'm talking about when he was six years old is now 14. But I can see him coming down the block. If my grandson is coming, there will be those of you who don't understand it. You will doubt that that's my grandson, just like they doubted that that was Jesus because they saw him when he was afar off. But I would look out there and say, that's my boy. How you know this? How can you tell? That's what they were saying. Here come Jesus. That's what Matthew was saying, because some doubted. How do you know that's Jesus? I know Jesus. I walked with Jesus. I recognize that man anywhere. Here he comes. And so they doubted. But then here's what he says in verse number 18. That clears it all up. I just wanted to set it up for you so I can make some clarity here. He says, and Jesus came and spake unto them. My, my, my. See, and Jesus came. See, you got to be a theologian. You got to want to spend time with God or otherwise. And then he came and spoke to them. Don't make sense to you. But that's, that's where the preacher comes to exegete the gospel. When they said, and he came, that means he walked up on them and he spoke. He said, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. He speaks now of his absolute sovereignty. All power. There is nothing on the other side of all. Not some power. Not a little bit of power. The Bible says all power. Jesus is saying, I'm the one. This is what you've been hearing about down through the ages. I am the one that the prophets spoke about. I am the one that you heard from your fathers and grandfathers down through the generations. He had to say it because now the season for his humiliation and his suffering was over. So we walk with, with, with Matthew, we, we gird our loins and we, we throw on his cloth and we stand as a disciple in our sandals. Because, because see, here it comes. Verses 18 through 20. We have come to the grand finale. Three of the most powerful verses in all of the Bible. Right here. In the final conclusion of the book of Matthew. Three of the most powerful verses that have been handed down through the generations. Christians and theologians alike will forever regard these three verses as the Great Commission. They will never be known by any other. These are the final marching orders of Jesus Christ. He himself intended 
to be looked upon as the Savior. So these are not just mere reverential words being spoken to some followers that they would continue in his footsteps after they had been so disappointed. God the Father is sending his ambassadors to proclaim the gospel throughout the entire world. Am I a fan or am I a follower? Beloved, the Great Commission is not just an order, but an announcement of victory. We walk in victory. That's the victory. Christ died, and now he's telling us to go into all the world, in all the land, and he says, I have all power. All power, for those of you who, who study Greek and Latin, in, in Greek, all, all power means exousia. It's just a word that I even like to say. It just sounds, sounds, sounds authoritative. Exousia. See, that's, that's what the police officer has when he, when he holds his hand up like that in front of your automobile and you stop the car. That's exousia. It's not his power. It's the power that came from on high. He has the power of exousia. I'm here this morning with exousia. The gospel I preach is through the power, the exousia power that's been handed down to me from the Savior. Almighty God has said all power. Now go into all the world and preach the gospel. You have been given the power. The exousia. Am I a fan or am I a follower? The Great Commission. That's the, the authenticity, the, the authority that each of us have. And we, and we have, if you are indeed a follower of Christ, he goes on in verse number 19 to say, Go ye, my God, my God. Mm. See, that, that's those shouting words. See, this is, this is in red. This is Jesus. Jesus, go ye, therefore. Whenever you see the word therefore, it, it is following what came precedingly. So therefore, go ye and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Go. Don't stand still. Don't sit down. Don't just sit back and reflect on this gospel. You have been called, I have been called to go out now and make disciples. That's exousia. Teach all nations. That means going to all the world, every, 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 every nook and every cranny, every bush, every alley, every street corner, preach all nations because this is speaking to the influence of the gospel. It has the power to drive or to draw. It has the converting power of the exousia power given to those who have been called through the power to preach the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is what we're here for this morning. This is what we seek this morning. Where do I get the courage? Where do I get the nerve? It's in Jesus. It's in the word. All nations has been, been, been put there for us not to exclude this power for just a sacred few. That's what I loved about Billy Graham. He went into Africa, preached it to the black man. Went into the Netherlands and preached it to the white man. He preached it to the brown man. This gospel is for every man, woman, and child, regardless as your race, creed, or color, your tongue, or your ethnicity. This is God's word. And for all of us who are in the word and followers of Christ, we are to proclaim the gospel. If you are not seeking to make a disciple, if your life is not living evidence that you are a disciple, you are a hamster running around in a cage and you will die a meaningless life. And here's the, here's the kicker. No one will ever know that you were here because you brought nothing to the table and you left nothing behind. Therefore, regardless of to who they are, it says, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, because of this authority that's been given to each and every one of us, our beloved, is to help us to be the disciples and the followers that God has called us to be. And he says, baptizing, 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 from the Latin word baptismo. Baptizo means to baptize. And what that means, it means to immerse. To baptize means to immerse. It doesn't mean to dip. 
It doesn't mean to sprinkle. It means to immerse. That's the proper mode. So when Jesus said baptize, that wasn't a, a misprint. Do as I've done. Do as you've seen me do. If you agree with this word that I preach to you this day from this mountaintop, then go and be baptized. Spread the gospel of Jesus. And once that's been done, then baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. There's only one baptism. This is it. And this is how it is done. He says, in the name. In the name of the Father. That means name, singular. See, there's no, nothing that's thrown away. Nothing can be tossed away in the word. In the name tells me that the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost are one. They're not Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The name says it all. Once you said, in the name of the Father, those that I have baptized, you stood with me in the water. And you understand, when I, that's what I'm saying. When I say I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, then I submerge you. And I bring you back up. I don't sprinkle water on you. I don't pour water on your head. That's not what Jesus said. He said, baptize. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. So you see, my beloved, the controlling purpose of the local church is to make disciples. Those who have been evangelized to, that would be you, should now then be baptized and then finish the final phase of the Great Commission. Train up disciples. Go into the world. Sometimes you just have to throw out the seed. Sometimes you meet someone who someone has already thrown out the seed. And then you come along and you water that seed. The young lady at, at, the, at the cashier yesterday, I threw out the seed. Someone's going to come behind me because God is like that. His word will never go forth and not come back void. So I threw out the seed. There will be another. I know this. I don't have to stand here and preach and try to change nobody. I don't have the power. I have exousia power. So it flows through me. If she had said she had a, a pastor, we could have talked about something else. But she didn't have a pastor. So now she knows you need a church because you're homeless. You're homeless. But someone else will, will tell her that. And she'll remember what I said. Then she'll remember what they said. And then you know what? Another will come and he'll reap the harvest. She'll find herself in a church one day, a church she may not have been to, like a, a crusade or a revival. And the doors of the church will be open and she'll come forward because of what she heard. You see how God works, church? It's a beautiful thing. Even when you don't know what God is, is, is up to, he's working it out. Even when you don't know what God is, is doing in your life, he's already got a plan. You don't have to sit around, God, what are you doing? God, just wait on the Lord. Wait on Jesus. He says, Lord, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the world. That means, Matthew, I'm still with you. John and Paul, Peter and Paul, he's still with them. Lo, I'm with you always. Jesus has not left Matthew, Mark, Peter, Paul, Isaiah. I love, I love what Isaiah says in, 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 in the first chapter, 19th verse. He said, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Ah! The 18th verse says, come, let us reason together. That's, that's what the prophets say. Write it down. Look it up for yourself later on. Isaiah 1 and 18 and 19. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. God wants to fellowship with me. I, I love that. The God that I serve wants to fellowship with me. Sister Leticia, he wants, to, he wants to be where I am. He wants to sit and commune with me. He wants to talk to me about some things going on in his mind. Can you imagine sitting down talking with God and him enlightening you to the things that are going on in his mind? First of all, he got he to come down, you know, especially in my case, he got to really bring it down because <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't the brightest candle on the cake. But he'll, he'll bring it down to wherever I am and, and, and break it down and put it in a way that I can understand. God ain't trying to confuse me. The God that I serve is not the author of confusion. If at any point you find confusion with this gospel, that ain't God. 
You call yourself walking this walking. Nothing is making sense to you. That ain't God. You don't read the Bible because you don't understand what's in this Bible. God is not giving you a book that you can't understand. He wrote it all so that you would be able to understand. And that which you don't understand, you ask. Are you a fan or are you a follower? That's what Jesus want to know. Why are you here? What are you seeking? The same old okie doke are you seeking fellowship with God? What's the purpose? Teaching them to observe all things. Whatever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Even unto the end of the world. What kind of love is that? I, I see you shaking your heads. You, you understand what kind of love that is? Uh, I, I know I'm not the only one, but since I, I'm here, I, I have to tell it because to, too many people have left me on this journey called life. They come into my life and they're, and they're there and I'm, I'm with you, I'm with you. I'm with you, I'm with you. And then when I turn around because there's, there's a storm up ahead, I look around and they're gone. Where did everybody go? I bear witness to that even this morning. I had a dear friend of mine who, who has gone on to transition with the Lord and he's going to be with the Lord and I've known him for over 40 years. And his wife called me last week and she says that this is what's happening and they're trying to prepare and I'm trying to encourage them. Here's what I said. My name is Maddie. I said, Maddie, whatever you need. How many times have you heard that one? Whatever you need, call me. Just let me know what you need. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll do it. You know, if it's within my power, I'll do it. People have a tendency to tell you whatever you need. And then when, when, when you ask them on the phone, they say, well, oh, I didn't know you meant that. I, I thought you meant but I'm a man of the cloth. I'm a, I'm a preacher. I said, whatever you need. And you know what she says to me the next day? She called me Bill because she knows me a long time. She says, Bill, would you preach his home going? Of course, Maddie. Of course I'd preach his home going. After all, I told you whatever you need. But here's the kicker. His home going is in Detroit, Michigan. So I'll be leaving out this week to eulogize a dear friend of mine because his family asked me, would you do it? And I told them, whatever you need. Don't tell somebody whatever you need and then don't do it. So this is, this is what, I, I, I didn't even have to seek God. I didn't even have to seek God. God, is this real? Because when she asked, all I knew to do was say, I'm on my way. Hold on, I'm on my way. That's where I come from these days. And as disciples of Jesus, this might make a, uh, something in the lives of her children or her grandchildren. They might see something in the fact when they hear word that this, this man came a long way to eulogize my father, eulogize my grandfather. What kind of God makes a way like that? This God. I'm only, I'm only executing the, the Great Commission. When he says, lo, I am with you always, this is what Isaiah was talking about in the seventh chapter in the 14th verse. He says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign and a virgin will conceive and give birth to a child. And you shall call his name Emmanuel. How many of you know what, what Emmanuel means? God with us. That, that's not, there, there again, that's not a type error. And you shall call his name Emmanuel. What Jesus is saying and what he means when he says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world, he's talking about what the prophet said in the 7th chapter, 14th verse. You will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. If you don't want to go back there, you can go back into uh, Matthew in the first chapter, 23rd verse. It says the same thing. Emmanuel, God is with us. 
And this is what he's commanded us to do. He's given us the great commission, especially those that have been called to be ministers and those that have been called to disciple. He told us to preach. And not just preach, he told us to teach and help someone else get saved because we all we have is the exousia power. Because you see, what we have is this gospel and the word to save and the word to salvation, the way to the cross is through the word. You preach the word. You can't save anybody. I don't have saving power. I have the exousia. So I break that bread. And when you hear the exousia, you go back and you say, what did he say, Isaiah 7, 14? What did he say, Galatians 6 and 7? That's right. And that's where the power comes from. Teach what we have learned. In other words, you and I have been given this morning what we are supposed to do. We've gotten our marching orders. We are to bring the pure unedited word of God. That is the power of salvation. Don't change nothing. Don't add anything to it. The Bible says don't take nothing away. So when you think the Great Commission, think about the one who sent us. Think about the one who, who gave us the, the command. Huh? Therefore, go. Huh? The Savior of the world. Huh? How he gave his life that hill on that hill called Golgotha. My Lord went up there and laid it all on the line. Huh. And how he was buried in a borrowed tomb of, of Joseph of Arimathea, loaned him his tomb to rest. And the Bible says that he laid there all night Friday night, yes, and all day Saturday, all night Saturday night, but early on Sunday morning, early on Sunday morning, the Bible says early on Sunday morning, the angels came and rolled away the stone. And when he rose, he rose with all power in heaven and in earth, and his words were left to you and I to be recalled this day, am I a fan or am I a follower? Amen?